Welcome back to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. I am your host, Lamont Gates, and joining us today is near-death experiencer, Mr. Derek Riddle. Derek, welcome to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'm glad you decided to come on the show to share your account, which I understand you came back with loads of information. Is that yeah. so? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, very, uh, <laughs> it was, it was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my entire existence. Fascinating. And we're going to get into that very shortly. But before we do, let's walk backwards. Let's talk a bit about your religious upbringing. Uh, was there any religious study or uh, traditions or teachings that you grew up with as a child? Well, uh, yeah, my mother, uh, the Hispanic side of my mother and with being single mom, uh, it was Catholic religion. And I mean, it was pounded into our head. Uh, I mean, she had us taking uh, catechism classes, um, doing the things to make our first communion, uh, Sunday school. Uh, she had like the little thing in the corner with the candles and the holy water. And she took she took her Catholicism very, very seriously. And yes, and I understand that's a pretty common thing in many near-death experiencers' lives prior to having their near-death experiences. Now, as you grew up, though, uh, did you continue to be a practicing Catholic? Uh, excuse me. We moved and kind of got out of the city and we lived in the desert. And so <clears throat> the uh, capabilities of being able to go to church all the time and stuff, uh, we weren't able to. Mom always uh, prayed. She always had a uh, rosary. She had a uh, uh, crucifix hung on the wall. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, as a child, I just kind of felt like it was just stuff that I had to do. I didn't really grasp the whole concept of religion. It was For me, it was just like going to school and learning more lessons and everything. It wasn't until I started to get older that I realized exactly like religion and, and whatnot. So. And what was and what was that like as an adult? What was religion like to you as an adult? You know, honestly, one of the first things that really like with in Catholic religion and whatnot, I and learning about like the devil and demon possession and things like that. Well, something else too is my mother happened to be a huge horror movie fan, and so when I watched The Exorcist, and I'm like demon possessions okay this is what they're talking about this, this like this is what happens to you like, oh my god no and so uh you know as a kid you know that's what they tell you you see this on hollywood and and you know uh the first time i watched the evil dead i was just like oh my god i'm gonna they're, they're you know <laughs> but uh you know as i got a little older and i learned and, and everything um i i I, I've always believed in trying to, you know, be good, and uh, even though it's Catholicism, the, you know, the basic premise was, you know, love your neighbor, be good, you know, um, and so those lessons, uh, I always tried to go by. My mother was a good lady as far as always trying to teach us right from wrong, and, and you know, nowadays they call it child abuse, but my mom was one of those where she was like, don't make me take you back out to the car. <laughs> yes, so, I, yeah, I, so. <laughs> you had a bit of rigidity growing up so why don't we go why don't we go into your near-death experience why don't you tell us first and foremost what yeah. was it that caused your near-death experience to occur okay well um excuse me uh july 14th of 2000 <clears throat> excuse me uh 20 I had a vertical gastrectomy surgery, and that is where they remove some of the lining of your uh, stomach, and uh, it involves some internal stitches. And so I had that surgery, and um, I was healing, and everything was fine. Uh, it was like almost 60 days later, 58 days later, I had some type of seizure. They didn't know what was wrong. Uh, I mean, I was doing the fish for like 45 minutes. I couldn't breathe. I didn't. And they said I was having an allergic reaction. Uh, uh, a few weeks later, it happened again. They didn't. They still didn't know. Um, 
the third time it happened, it happened so suddenly and so fast. My I started turning blue. My daughter called the ambulance. They took me. They took me in, and um, same thing. They ran these tests, and they didn't know, and they kept saying I was having some kind of allergic reaction, and uh, they sent me home. And <clears throat> forty-eight hours later, <clears throat> I was due to fly on a plane from Spokane, Washington to Las Vegas to help my mother, or excuse me, my grandmother drive a U-Haul back up here to Spokane. She was moving up here. So when I got on that plane and I flew, what had happened, well, fast forward a little bit so you understand that the flying on the plane during my surgery, and this is all coming from the surgeon when I woke up in the Las Vegas hospital, um, it appeared that my spleen had been lacerated and I was bleeding internally. And so those seizures that I were having were septic seizures that my spleen, it would bleed out and then my body would kind of try to scab over it. And then I would do something just through normal activity and compromise it. It would bleed out again. Then it would bleed out again. And what happened was when I got on that airplane, the pressurization from flying just <clears throat> and Within 24 hours, I was being airlifted to the emergency room at, <clears throat> excuse me, at Spring Valley Hospital in Las Vegas. Gotcha. Now, when you entered the hospital, did your experience start there or did it start later? Uh, no, my experience, uh, it, it, you know, when I was in the helicopter and I was flying there and I was in extreme amount of pain um, and I have a high threshold for pain. I, you know, I, I was also raised tough. You scrape your knee, just rub some dirt on it. You know, I, I broke my leg once and it was actually 24 hours later that I figured, you know, I, I should probably go get it looked at <laughs> and it was broken. So, so anyhow, I'm, I'm flying in this helicopter and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is pretty bad. They're airlifting me and I'm trying to judge this. Like, and I don't know what's going on. All I know is my, I feel like I'm going to explode and the pain is, it felt like somebody was taking my insides and just stretching them. And I mean, I'm doubled like this. And when I get off the helicopter and, they, and they're wheeling me in, as they're wheeling me in, they're asking me, Mr. Riddle, if, if we need to give you blood, can we give you blood? You'll, you'll probably need blood. And I'm like, okay. And I said, okay, you got to sign these releases. And <clears throat> so I signed the releases. And as I was signing those, that's when it started dawning on me. Like, I, I this is for real. This is, there's, you know, this, they're, they're asking to give me blood. This is, this is it. And, uh, they got me in and they started uh, uh, putting a mask on me and everything and, you know, asking me my name and, and you know, the doctor introduced himself and everything. It just, it all seemed to happen so fast. And then uh, <clears throat> that was it until I went under. And what was it like when you went under? Is that when your experience began? Yes. Okay, why don't you tell us a bit about what it was that you encountered in this experience? Okay, so uh, yeah, the last thing I remember was looking up at the ceiling in, uh, in the hospital and with the mask on and me breathing, just thinking, okay, and just trying to relax and just thinking to myself, all right, they, they got me, I'm in good hands. I'm, all right, <clears throat> and then I, like, I opened my eyes and real quick, I realized I wasn't in the hospital. It was like I was overlooking this giant platform. And I'm looking and it's it was like a sea of people. There were, there were people and there were different kinds of people. And it was like, it was a big crowd. And it was, I, I, like I explained before, I'd mentioned, uh, I described it as like Grand Central Station, very crowded, very, very, very crowded, like elbow, very hot, very, very sticky. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to a concert or been somewhere where you're just jammed up with people and it's that. And that's how it was. And in the back was like, I could feel the energy. I could feel the negativity, the badness, the like back there. I felt 
like that's where the evil was like when i say evil i mean like serial killer like like serial rapists like bad bad people like that and when i also say like that not just necessarily people that physically hurt people but like these people that are that people that are in charge of corporations and steal people's entire lives and funds and and literally make people go homeless and they, and they sleep like a baby like like no conscience having people was what was in the back and anyhow i'm looking at all this and i'm trying to absorb all this and i'm and it's weird because i'm sitting there and i'm like what the am i what is this and as i'm looking and i can feel all this energy the badness and i'm looking at these crowds and they're they're going this way and they start to break off into these lines and these different lines and the energy it seemed to uh it seemed to change and not be so negative uh, almost like a river flowing and and getting more clearer less muddy as i got closer and as it got closer, these lines broke off into different lines. And they went to, the only thing I can describe what looked like, like uh, like that, the bank tube, when you go to the bank, there was, it was, uh, it was like a stream, like a slip stream. And when they stepped in, and it brought you back to all this. And what i saw through that was like what i felt what came to me was i realized that i thought okay this is this has to be judgment and these are the people that messed up really really bad and that's why they're in the back and these are the people that probably just have to go again at that point looking in the lines i was looking down the lines and i saw my grandmother she was the she was next in line to go in and at that point i saw two other people that i know one was about a quarter of the way down the line the other one was in the same line but a little bit farther down i won't say their names i haven't said them I, they don't know i've never said anything to them uh, I've never said anything to my grandmother either. Um, so is now, your, just to, just to interject really quickly, is your grandmother still currently alive? She is currently alive, but it, it, for, for family reasons, uh, there was some friction and we had some falling out and whatnot, and we just haven't uh, communicated. Uh, she was with me through the whole accident. She was with me afterwards. She was there when I got home and got better. And I was going to, when the time was right, just say, Hey, grandma, you know, I, I just think you need to know something, but, and you know, family, sometimes the families do that. And we'd had a, a falling out and we just haven't spoke yet, but she is in good health and she's at home and, you know, but I, this is also something you don't just tell somebody in a five minute phone call. So I just, so you are in this crowd of what what you could probably probably describe as if you took all the world sociopaths and jammed them into one room that's the energy you were feeling and you saw people in moving into a line formation almost like the stream of a river getting popped back into another realm and you uh -huh. saw you saw your grandmother and you saw other people and now are these other people still living also um, and you know, the other two that I saw that I recognized are still living. There are other people that I saw that I didn't recognize, but I have a feeling that if I ever saw them in real life, like, because I could close my eyes and picture their face. And I've actually kind of struggled with that scenario. Like, what if I'm at the store and I run into that person? Am I, am I meant to have to, you know, actually say something to that person, right? <laughs> you know, but, but this is 2021. They probably think I'm psycho. <laughs> yeah, well, the fascinating thing about it is that usually near-death experiencers, when they have an experience, they're usually seeing the deceased. But you're in rare cases, there have been people who saw 
um, individuals that were still living. Uh, the, the psychologist Carl Jung, for example, saw his medical doctor in his near-death experience. And later on, that medical doctor ended up passing away. Not sure if that's the meaning of seeing someone who's alive, but nonetheless, take us through what you saw next. Okay. And, well, you know, and with seeing those people, too, the, the weird part was, like, if you've ever seen the movie Beetlejuice, a lot of those, I mean, they weren't all just wearing the same uniform. Like, I remember one guy in particular, he was, like, he was mangled, and he was in the back, and he looked like it was he was in an accident or something, but he was, like, jacked up, and, like, it, it, there were, it, it, you know, it's just not everybody looked the same. Some people looked messed up physically, some looked sickly something but it was all just the, the bad negative in the back but anyhow so as i'm overlooking this platform i just kind of i feel like i'm just lifted a little bit and i'm overlooking everybody and, and like i said i'm watching this and this is all coming to me and i'm feeling all these energies and everything and i do like this and i look up to my left and there was this bright light shining down and it looked like a fluorescent light like a kitchen fluorescent tube light it wasn't so blinding that i couldn't look at it but the only way that i can describe as far as me not looking at it, it was almost like i like oh like like i didn't feel worthy to stare at it but i saw it and the direction it was coming at me it was coming it was like it was this way and this way and when I looked up and what I felt was I honestly, it did not feel like a singular entity. It felt like a council. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with a council. In fact, the last interview I had was with a young lady who said she was standing before a council who had to decide her fate, whether she should come back or not. Uh, what was this encounter like? Um. Well, so I'm, I'm standing there and I look up and I, I see the light. And the first thing I, I feel is like, you're not worthy to look at that kid. Look away. And I look back down and I look back down and I just, I kind of brought my head to out of my peripheral vision. And now the communication that I had with them was, I don't know, I guess telepathic. It wasn't like speaking and it wasn't. Uh, there was no like beginning or end of a sentence. It was just, there's the info and, and there it is. And I was asked, do you believe in God? Just like that. Now, here's my issues with the Catholic religion. Uh, I am a sexual abuse survivor and with the, uh, Catholic religion scandals going on with the churches. We don't have to go into any of all that. But that has made me seriously question Catholicism and how I was raised and how, you know, just all that. But I've always considered myself a good person, a spiritual person. I, I, I believed, even as a kid, like, I just saw the world and I saw, you know, there's bad people. And I don't, I don't want to be a bad person. I want to be a good person. But when that projected and said, do you believe in God? Like, that's what I projected back, basically, was like, I think you should just be good, you know? And blah, blah. so anyhow, when I said that, it instantly looks like, like if someone took a deck of cards and put it right in front of your eyes right here and just, <clears throat> and fluttered them. And it it was doing that and it, and it spit out. It looked like, <laughs> looked like a, ball like and like a globe and it spit out this globe two of them and each one it was like a scene that i'm watching over here in front of me and the first one and these are true stories the first one was i was like six years old something like that and i had woke up to go use the restroom it was my two in the middle of the night you know and i don't know why but on my way back I decided to go into the living room and turn on the TV. And I did. 
and the TV came on and it was those commercials where they showed like the starving kids in other countries and it and they were showing these kids and it was the ones with the flies and you could see their ribs up here and everything and I just started bawling man I mean I was just like bad bad Enough that I woke up my mom, that she comes out in the living room, like, what the hell, what are you doing, blah, blah, and, I, and I'm like, mom, they're hungry, they're hungry, that's not fair, that's, and my mom, she was, you know, half asleep, one eye open, and then, like, you could tell it was clicking to her, and she, like, she took a minute, and she just, oh, she just did it, you know, because she's just saying, oh, mijo, mijo, mijo come on, come here, come here. And she went and she took me to bed and she sat me down and she just tried to explain and she used God that, you know, sometimes, you know, God God is there and God loves them and, you know, and they're, they're going to be okay and this and that. But that was the memory that was pulled out of me and replayed. The second memory, fast forward years later, um, I'm a young boy. Uh, my mother is working graveyard shifts at that time. And it's, it's Halloween, and I wanted to go trick or treating. And there was a couple of like uh, boys that were a couple of years older than me next door, and they were going to go trick or treating. So I said, "Hey, mom, since the boys are going to go next door, and you got to go to work, is it okay if I can go trick or treating if I go with them?" And she's like, "Yeah, no problem." So we went out, me and two boys, and I mean, we cleaned up, bro. We had. I mean, I, I went home. My bag was it was filled, right? So I get home with my candy and I'm not even home a couple minutes and there was a knock at the door and I went over and I opened the door and there were trick-or-treaters and I was like oh okay and I went and I looked around and my mom didn't buy any candy and all I had was my candy and I was like all right I'll just give him a couple pieces here you guys go and so I gave him some candy and sent him on my way pretty soon there was another knock at the door and then another one and then another one and I'm like my God, what am I going to do? Dude, I ended up giving out all of my candy. Even I remember even down to the last piece and me being mad about it the whole time. <laughs> but I gave it all away. Yeah, and, and, I, yeah, and I think I see the theme here. You, you <laughs> right, said... And, 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 you know, the next morning when my mom got home, of course, and I get up and she's like, so, where's that candy? You know? <laughs> And uh, I'm like, I gave it all away. And she's like, what? And I said, well, you didn't buy any candy last night. When I got home, uh, you know, we kept getting trick-or-treaters. So I gave it away. <laughs> and she goes, you've been that whole, why did you do that? And I said, well, mom, because I didn't have the heart to tell them that we didn't have any more candy. And that was exactly what I told her. Anyhow, so as those two moments played, I looked back this way and I was kind of lowered and I was pulled through the crowd. And as I was pulled through that crowd and it bubbled, it was like I was inside one of those bubbles that I just watched. And it pulled me through the crowd. And as I went through the crowd was when I saw the two people that I knew and other people that I didn't know. And like I said, I struggle with the people that I, and when I say the, the people that I saw, it was, it was weird because it was blurry, but all of a sudden they were like right there, like, whoa. <laughs> and of the two people that I saw, one of them I did communicate with. And if that person is watching this, I said, oh my God, you're here. And they went, eh. And that person, by going like that, that person will know who they are because that's their little. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, so it, it pulled me through. And as I got through towards the end, it went up a few steps and there were these metal doors and they were all chained and they were like rusty, ugly, like high school metal doors to the gymnasium. And the chains just broke. And as they broke the doors open and I was pulled through these doors. And as soon as I was, um, I was pulled into a funeral home and I was looking at a funeral of what was happening. And uh, I realized uh, my childhood, one of my childhood best friends that I had grown up with, I was, I was at his funeral. 
I was looking at him laying in a coffin. I saw his family standing there, his wife, his son, his two daughters. Um, they were all on this side and on this side were his two brothers. And, and it's weird because he has two brothers and a sister, but the sister was over here with them, but just his two brothers were over here, but they're all really tight. And, and it was, what I remember about it was my friend's son, who right now is about 10. Uh, he looks like he was maybe 12 or 13. So it looked like maybe something that was a couple few years down the road. And uh, it, it was it was pretty intense uh, seeing him like that. So it sounds like you had a roller coaster of experiences. Uh, you had a life review, it sounds like, with these two globes showing you your childhood and uh, feeling the empathy of, of the other people that were homeless that you saw on television. And then an image of yourself in Halloween ending up giving away your prized and cherished uh, candies that you collected because you realized you didn't have any candy at home, but you got these knocks on the door. So you ended up giving your candy away, which answered your question uh, right. or, or responded to your statement saying you believe in just being a good person. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, the, the thing was after I saw my friend in his funeral it, it, and I realized what was going on, I did, and nothing was said. It was just the family looking over him crying. And then I was pulled past that. And I was pulled past that and above. And as I was, it was like, it was like I, I came into nighttime with no stars. There was nothing under me. It was, it was like a void. Um, I used to live on the coast. And, uh, and sometimes at night it would be, the moonlight would be so bright it would cast a shadow and you could literally do shadow puppets on the beach at midnight off of the moonlight, but it was still dark. That's how, that's the only way I can describe like this void thing that I was looking at. And I'm looking and as I'm looking, I see this light coming towards me and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally forms in front of me and it looked like a white glowing suit. But it was my friend Sharon, a very, very dear friend that I'd known for over 20 years that I'd worked with for 10 years. Um, you know, I had several family dinners, like she, would, she was like family and she had passed away from cancer just the summer before, a few months before this happened. So, that's who came to me and when I saw her like that and I was looking and I was like oh my god and and she was like like 300 feet tall I mean she was huge in front of me up in the sky and I was looking and I was like Sharon and she's all hi jumpy hi like that and and it's weird because every time I would see her at work you know, my nickname is Jumpy, and every time I would see her at work or or whatever, that's always what she did. She always smiled and said, hi, Jumpy. And when she did that, hi, Jumpy, I was like, Sharon? Oh, my God. And for being where I was and everything, when I say it was so real and lucid, at that moment, I'm in my head, right there, I'm like, wait a minute, you're dead. What am I doing? And that's when I was like, wait Sharon wait a minute you're oh my god shit am I and <laughs> and give me just two seconds sure no problem take your time <sighs> I wanted to grab a couple pictures here and she proceeds to go Jumpy, look! And she pointed behind me. And behind me was this lady here. And that is Barbara. That was my mother-in-law. And that is my late son who passed away when he was only six months old. That is my son, Cody. Now, my son, and this was 25, 
27 years ago. Uh, he passed away, and Barbara, his grandmother, had cancer the whole time, and we didn't know it, and tragically, she passed away like seven weeks later. It wasn't even two months, so I was married, and so me and my wife, we buried our child, and then we turned around and buried Barbara. And when the time was getting close with Barbara, not too long before she passed away, when I was just sitting with her and I was holding her hand, she said, I want you to know something. And I said, what? And she goes, when it's your time, me and your son will be there waiting for you. And when I saw Sharon and Sharon and she's like, hi, Jumpy, hi. She goes, look, like that. And she pointed behind her. And I looked and there was Barbara. Same thing, huge, like glowing. And I was like, oh my God, Barbara. And this time she pointed to her right. She goes, look. And I looked over and it was like, a giant light coming down out of the darkness and it was shining on a playground and on this playground right in the middle was one of those old school metal carousels that you see on the playgrounds the kind that just they just spin and go around you know you put your friend on and you try to <laughs> you know you spin them off but i looked and um uh, I, I saw my son there playing and he was like seven years old, maybe six or seven. He was he was like that same age that I was when I was looking at that TV that morning. And he was playing. And I and I was like, oh my God, is that? And I looked at Barbara and I said, Is that? Is that? And she just goes, uh-huh. And I said, Can I go see him? And she goes, uh-huh. And I took a step, and as soon as I did. It, it, it felt like a, you ever stretch a rubber band and you feel that rubber band like if you stretch it anymore it's going to break because where I was it was almost like a it was almost like a, a magnetational type of like a pulling force and when I saw my son and I said can I go see him and I took like two steps I stopped <laughs> completely lucid in my head and I went wait a minute wait a minute you're you're supposed to be driving a u-haul right now we don't because we flew there we got off the plane at 10 in the morning we drove straight to grandma's we packed up all day and we're going to hit the road at seven in the morning and by six that morning was when I was bent over holding my guts and I couldn't so I they took me to the hospital to get checked before we hit the road and and uh now you're recalling this at yeah. this moment yeah yeah and and like i'm recalling all this like wait a minute they're all waiting on me i got i can't i can't i can't i can't i can't go it was like i knew if i went there like that it, it was too far it was like I, it was a one-way trip i knew it was a one-way trip i could have went to my son and I looked up and I looked at Barbara and I looked at Sharon and I put my hands up when I said, I can't, I can't go yet. I can't. And I mean, like it, everything went through my head, not just my grandma, not just them waiting on me, but like I have children. I just had a granddaughter in September. I have a 16 year old daughter that still lives at home. Um, I just, I, I've got all these responsibilities and and, and all that went through my head, and I'm like, wait, I, I can't, I can't go, I can't, and, and I looked up, and just the way they floated in, Sharon floated out, and she was going, okay, bye, Jumpy, bye, bye, and she did just like that, and um, that's, that's when I woke up in the hospital. Wow, as I stated earlier, this is absolutely a roller coaster of a an, of a near death experience. Uh, so, you you're at a funeral of a friend. You move from there. You 
you see a friend who was deceased and you end up seeing a son, your son who was deceased. Now you, it seems like you're starting to see the deceased people that near-death experiencers usually encounter in their experiences. And just as you're trying to step forward to greet these uh, deceased individuals, you recall your life on earth. And so you are brought back into your body. What was it like coming back into your body? And by the way, were you given any information by medical staff that you had coded? Uh, you know, I have the full report. I, I, what had happened was when I woke up in the hospital, okay, and I woke up to the surgeon saying, you know, that Mr. Riddle, Derek, you know, how are you, are you okay? Can you hear me? And I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm coming out of it. And do you know where you're at? And, and yeah, I'm in the hospital. And while I'm saying this, everything that just happened to me is going through my head. Like, I mean, it wasn't like I recalled it later down the road. I mean, when I say it's like your favorite movie that you've seen a hundred times. I remember every single little thing from the beginning to the end, every single detail. And so as I'm, as the doctor's asking me these questions, I'm like, of course I'm half out of it, but I'm like, what the, what was that? What, what just happened to me? And then, so the doctor's talking to me and blah, blah. And then, and then he says, he goes, okay, so it wasn't the stitches popped in your stomach. And then it, right when he said that, I realized, oh, yeah, because I'd said I'd had that surgery and I'd had stitches. And so when they were asking me when I went in what they thought could be wrong, that was what I said. I, I think I might have popped stitches. And he said it wasn't that. It was your spleen. And I was like, what? what? And he said, the work that I had done where it's at, my spleen is right there. And what it appears is my spleen was compromised and um they went in thinking i popped stitches and he says and when we cut you open the first thing we noticed was the smell they drained 850 milliliters of blood out of me at the surgery and uh to give you an idea like a, a regular size bottle of wine is 750 so it, 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 that'd be even more than that. That's what they pumped out then. The very next morning, they pumped out 650 more. Um, and through the course of the next uh, week, they pumped out almost 500 more. And uh, I think they here with my doctors, once I got home, I think they said I hold the, the record for wearing a pump for the longest. I had a pump for 49 days pumping the poison out of my body. Wow, that's that alone yeah. is intense. You had an intense ride in the spiritual realm, and you had one clearly in the physical realm. So yeah. many near-death experiencers describe coming back with some sort of sixth sense, some sort of precognition, uh, higher empathy levels. Uh, did you come back with anything that appeared to be out of the ordinary uh, yeah. after your near-death experience? Yeah, you just said it right there at the end, the empathy thing. <laughs> it's weird i've always thought i was a sensitive guy and i thought hey, you know little girly man that's all i'm just you know suck it up be a dude you know but it wasn't until i had that experience when i was looking and i went back to that moment of seeing those kids you know what it was i wasn't sad that they were doing that i felt what they were feeling that i was completely overwhelmed with hunger with with sadness with despair with like i felt that and that is why i started freaking out and and the trick-or-treaters because when they came and i was like oh we don't have any candy they were like oh you don't have any candy and i and i thought well i have my candy and i was like and I could just feel their disappointment. And so I was like, hold on. And I meant to just give out some of my candy. And yeah, well, <laughs> that's how that turned out. I gave it all out. But, uh, and it was, and it was then that I started connecting, like, and I don't know if it channeled it and made it more or what, cause like, man, dude, going to the grocery store now 
<laughs> I just, I am in and out now, dude. I can't, I can't, I can't do crowds of people. I can't, I just, it's, and, and I, I feel like even meeting new people after I'm around them for a while, I feel like I pick up on their vibes or their vibration and I can, I just feel good energy or bad energy in a way that how I was feeling all that energy when I was looking over the platform. Yeah, sounds as if that empathy that you felt in that near-death experience certainly came back with you in, in this realm. Um, has anything else ever happened in your life that you can now understand better why it happened because of your near-death experience? I know you mentioned COVID off the record. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, and it's weird because like when I saw how everything went, like I, I kind of felt like, it made sense as far as like this being a test and the people coming back, like you, like you have to do something right. Like this whole life is a test and you could fail right here or you could fail all the way here, but you still have to finish the entire test and you have to do something right in that lifetime. And if you don't get it right, that's when you come back and depending on how bad you screwed up depends on how far back in that line you are. When I was under and I was, and I was, I don't know why, but I felt like those people that were in the back were doomed to sit there for 900 years. I don't know why that number comes into my head, but that they had to sit there for 900 years before they were even allowed to get in line and start working their way up towards the front. So in other words, everybody has some sort of um, wrong they've done. They come back. They correct the wrong, but for those who really went out of bounds, there is a specific place they have to be before they can even get in line to come back to right the wrong. Right, and 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 it doesn't necessarily have to be a wrong. It, it, it's just it, it's something you have to learn something in this lifetime. It has to be right. It could even be something as simple as as empathy. Like maybe you didn't apologize enough and you need to learn that through your life, you know, um, or maybe you were too selfish. And, and But I felt like when you came back, like it, it, I definitely felt like it was a life form with a soul, whether it be like a big animal or definitely another person. I had a flash of like rules of life and the Ten Commandments in a, in a way, like like the meaning of like, for example, thou shall not kill. That one actually came through. And like, if you're hunting to feed your family, like that's okay. But if you're going to go shoot a rhino just to hang its head on the wall and say, look what I've been. Like that's, that, that's where the like thou shalt not, like in a cold-blooded murderous type of way like that. And you know? Interestingly, you say that because the Hebrew word for murder is different than the word kill in the in the hebrew bible and it actually reads thou shall not murder rather than thou shall not kill so that's interesting that you say that um is there anything you'd like to tell anyone out there who may be on the fence about spirituality i know you were asked do you believe in god in your near-death experience uh anybody out there who has been told by religious organizations being good, being a good person is not good enough. Uh, anything you want to tell anybody about um, that particular um, information now that you've come back from your near death experience? What that life review, what I felt like was basically how did you live your life? You know, whether or not I practice a certain religion. <laughs> or whether or not I made sure to eat fish on Friday, or who I even chose to love for that matter. None of that came up. It was all my actions and basically how I treated other people and how I lived my life. That, that was what I was judged on. And, 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 you know, like with doing those things when I was a kid, um, I, I, I've always been that way. Every year, with just this last Thanksgiving, every year, uh, me and my daughter, we make some plates and we go find the first, you know, street people we can find. And we just say, hey, you know, you guys should get a hot meal today. That's just something we've always done. And I don't post it on Facebook. This is the first time I've mentioned it. I don't, you know, we just do it because it's a nice thing to do. And 
but the the review all that that they it seemed they were only concerned with my actions and how i lived and how i affected what was around me and biblically speaking i think you would be fulfilling what's known as the golden rule or the royal law and that is to love your neighbor exactly that's that's exactly like you know i <laughs> I, I i don't have a racist bone in my body I, you know, some of my best friends are gay. I don't, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those where like assholes come in all colors, man. You know, either, either you're, either you're just an asshole or you're not, but you know, and if you can just be good, if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. I don't. And that's the thing that I don't understand that I did. It seems so simple, but yet unachievable. And I don't, that's the part I don't get. I just, and I think that's also part of the test is living and going through all of this ickiness and still trying to be good like that on the other side. Because from what I saw and what I felt over there, it wasn't so much unicorns and rainbows popping off as it was just the incredible peacefulness and love of knowing that everything around me was pure and there was nothing that was going to hurt me because it was all pure well you speak about the meanness in the world and hopefully with your near-death experience and your higher heightened uh empathetic views of the world now you can cause a ripple effect to start allowing other people with your goodness and your kindness towards them to start reflecting more on some of the good and bad they've done and probably begin to help change their ways I, I, it would be a good start. Well, with that said, uh, Derek, I want to thank you for coming on Real Spiritual Talk Radio and sharing your absolutely fascinating account. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Derek Riddle. Thanks, guys.